Hola, muy buenos días a todos. Buenas tardes. Eh, un, un gusto volverlos a tener aquí en un webinar más de la Federación Mexicana en la Industria Aeroespacial. El webinar del día de hoy eh, vamos a transmitirlo en inglés. Eh, va, va a estar relacionado eh, o está enlazado con, los, con lo que viene siendo Challenges for Space Interconnection, Cases and Solutions. En este caso vamos a tener la participación de Alexandre Borsoy, quien es Business Development Manager por la parte de la, eh, de la empresa Axon Cable, quien es quien ahora nos apoya en la transmisión y difusión de este material. Eh, de igual manera, comentarles que tendremos un webinar este miércoles 18 de marzo. Eh, está relacionado al tema de fenómenos electromagnéticos en la industria aeronáutica, la física por medio de gemelos digitales. En esta ocasión, Grupo SSC es quien nos va a estar ayudando en, la, en, el, en poder compartir este material con ustedes. El registro ya lo pueden hacer desde este momento. Es este miércoles 18 de marzo, 11 a.m., tiempo del centro. Contamos por ahí con un código QR para que puedan hacer el, el, el registro en este momento. Y de igual manera, pues, tenemos nuestro, nuestro link de registro para que puedan acceder a, a la página de, de, de conexión. Eh, bueno, para todos aquellos que no conocen datos sobre FEMIA, pues nosotros somos una asociación privada fundada desde el 2007 y pues agrupamos a las empresas que manufacturan eh, eh, componentes para el sector aeroespacial en México, las cuales son las principales eh, en diferentes áreas, ¿no? como es la manufactura, el mantenimiento, diseño de ingeniería y otros servicios. Contamos ya con más de 110 miembros, con el, los cuales representan el 80% de las exportaciones aeroespaciales del país. El origen del capital está diversificado de tal manera que el 65% corresponde a empresas extranjeras y el 35% a empresas mexicanas. Somos la contraparte privada del gobierno federal y colaboramos con organismos afines nacionales e internacionales. Por ahí pueden ver los logos con los organismos que hemos realizado algunos convenios y con los que colaboramos de manera activa. En este slide van a poder visualizar todos los miembros que, que nos conforman. Eh, por ahí van a poder conocer algunos logos que son muy grandes, otros más pequeños. Sin embargo, pues todos son igual de importantes para nosotros, ya que ellos son los que conforman el sector aeroespacial. 
Eh, referente al staff, eh, les, les voy a presentar de primera manera a la licenciada Pamela Arellano, quien es la directora de operaciones, Mónica Vega, que es la directora de promoción, Mariana González, que es gerente de gestión y membresía, la licenciada Marta Ortuño, quien es la asistente de dirección, eh, de igual manera el, el ingeniero Luis Liscano, quien es el presidente ejecutivo, ejecutivo perdón, del organismo, y René Espinosa, que es el presidente del consejo su servidor, Enrique Maldonado, que participa en la parte de desarrollo de proveedores. Eh, y bueno, mencionarles también que vamos a contar con una sesión de preguntas y respuestas en el área de chat, para que por favor ahí nos empiecen a compartir sus dudas, sus comentarios. Vamos a tener un espacio para que Alexandre nos pueda hacer este, eh, clarificación de alguna de estas preguntas. La presentación, se los menciono, va a ser en inglés. Sin embargo, eh, las preguntas nos las pueden compartir en español sin ningún problema. Entonces, para que, para que puedan ahí participar y de igual manera que nos mencionen desde dónde se están conectando. Bueno, sin más, eh, I'm going to introduce Alexandre Borsoy. Eh, eh, has, eh, Alexandre has a technical background in various fields, for example, space, aeronautics, defense, and automotive, and an understanding of related markets to promote action solution worldwide in Asia. India, Japan, and South Korea, and also in Mexico. He's based in Querétaro, and uh, he participated and developed the commercial activities and local promotion for the capabilities from Axon. So this is the, a brief uh, uh, background of Alexandre, and Alexandre, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. The microphone and the screen is ready for you, and thank you for, for attending this webinar, and welcome, Alexandre. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you to the FMEF for the, for the introduction and for the opportunity today. And thank you to everybody for, for your time. So to, today I will present you briefly uh, our company, Accent Cable, and our solutions, obviously. But the most uh, important subject today will be the presentation of space challenges that uh, you may face uh, during the design of uh, space, uh, space projects based on uh, real cases uh, studies. So Axon is a French group. Uh, it's located in the uh, Champagne area uh, near Paris. So no need to tell you uh, what is our specialty for, for drinks uh, here. It's located one hour, one hour and a half from, uh, from Paris, uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport. Uh, the turnover last year was 1 million seven, uh, 170 million uh, euros. Uh, we have 2,200 people around the world in uh, uh, 20 different countries, and we are now 25 uh, located in Caletaro, in our, in our factory. And we design and manufacture uh, advanced interconnection solutions. So what does it mean? Uh, we, we, we start the manufacturing, design and manufacturing of the of our product from the very beginning of the, of the solution, interconnection uh, solution, uh, which is a conductor. So we do the uh, preparation of the conductor and plating as well in-house. We manufacture the wire uh, and cables, so more or less complex. It can be simple wire or complex composite cables. We manufacture the connectors, including every components uh, of uh, of the connectors, mainly for micro D nano D uh, connectors. Uh, I will explain a bit later. Uh, we manufacture assemblies and harnesses, as well as what we call mini system, which is a bit more complex than just a harness. It will in, uh, include mechanical or electronic uh, functions. It can be uh, uh, PCB integration, for example, for mechatronic uh, solutions. And to do this, we have uh, 3D printing, we have different tools, uh, 3D printing mainly for plastic and uh, metallic parts. And we have a various range of tests and qualification uh, in-house or subcontracted. Uh, today, we will focus on space, obviously. So I'll just present you uh, to give you the context, uh, some of our heritage. Uh, we work for different launchers, mainly Ion5 and Vega. Uh, we have a huge range of uh, satellites for which we deliver uh, harnessing for, for signal, power, distribution, and so on. 
uh, we will come back later for mega constellation. We have made also uh, complete inter interconnection solutions, so which is as well the complete harness of the satellites. And we are not also only focusing on on Earth orbit, but also uh, deep space. So we are on on Mars, uh, solar observation, and so on. So as you probably know already, uh, space is a very harsh environment, and you have to consider different factors when you want to send uh, something uh, up there. Uh, vacuum, uh, basically, uh, extreme temperature can be very, very high, very low as well. Radiation resistance, and also some mechanical constraints, uh, especially during the launch of the, of the rocket. And you also have to, to fit uh, specific requirements, which is most importantly the mass and the capacity of your, of your system. And different uh, technical uh, requirements can be magnetism, signature, outgassing, uh, thermal stress, and so on. So when you, whenever you develop this kind of solution, you have to consider all these factors and meet each and every parameters. So luckily, uh, we have some space agencies. Uh, in Europe, we have the European Space Agency, the ESA, in America, NASA. We have one in uh, local in Mexico, in India, in Japan. This kind of agency that will basically define standards uh, for components or materials. And it will help you uh, selecting proper solution, which will be uh, qualified and trusted uh, to be used in space. So we have different ones for, for cables and connectors. However, and unfortunately, this kind of standard does not cover all the technical requirements. Uh, mainly the temperature is limited to plus minus 200 degrees. Uh, radiation resistance also is not that high. So in this case, uh, whenever you have uh, requirements which are not within this range, uh, you have to be innovative and use uh, specific solutions. So here we are. Today we'll cover these eight different, uh, different challenges. Uh, the mass, uh, mass and space saving, first uh, uh, important, important subject. Flexibility of the wires, bundle. Uh, extreme temperature, in that case, uh, extremely low temperature. Radiation resistance and ad hoc resistance, which are both uh, kind of similar uh, in the similar context. ESD, uh, elect electric, uh, electrostatic discharge uh, protection. And last point will be the cost and production capacity, uh, kind of new subject here in, uh, in the space market. So let's start with the, the mass uh, saving. So as you know, uh, launching uh, satellites in space is very expensive and it's mostly uh, related to the, to the cost. So this figure, $10,000 10, per kg, is maybe outdated because of all the different launchers uh, we have now. But it gives you an idea of how important it is to save uh, every gram uh, in every possible uh, way. So when we talk about power distribution in uh, big satellites, telecom satellites, uh, we talk about 400 amps, which is quite a lot. And when you use uh, copper wires, which is the most common uh, conductor which is used in uh, harnessing, you need to use big section and the weight will be quite high. The copper conductivity is excellent, but the weight is also uh, an issue. So as an alternative, we can propose aluminum, which is three times less than, uh, than copper. And even if it has uh, less conductivity, we will see later, uh, the overall mass saving is quite interesting. So our range of uh, aluminum wire is called Axalu. It's silver plated aluminum and it's covering the range from gauge six to gauge uh, 24. So six would be uh, more for power distribution, 24 would be for signal. So as mentioned, uh, the conductivity of copper and aluminum is not the same. So whenever you have a gauge 
uh, a dedicated gauge for copper, you have to increase slightly the section for aluminum to have the same electrical performance. So in this uh, example, if you take uh, gauge 22 for in copper, copper conductor, you will have to take a gauge 20, which is slightly bigger uh, in aluminum, but still you will get some uh, mass saving. And as you can see here, by replacing the conductor and the shield with aluminum, you end up with a mass reduction of 35%. So this range actually is quite old, more than 20, 25 years old, and is used in different satellites. So one example is uh, Arab cells. The next subject, quite similar to, to the mass saving, is uh, space saving, miniaturization. So whenever you talk about miniaturization, you either want to reduce the size of your satellite to, to make it smaller, uh, like a microsat or nanosat, or in this, uh, in this particular case, you want to fit more electrical equipment in the same, uh, in the same space. And that's a case uh, that we had for, for a satellite. Uh, in 2007, uh, we have made uh, Terrasat, and 2015, uh, there was a new second version of this satellite. The difference between both is the radar panel, which has twice more uh, transmission modules than, uh, than the previous version. So this is to increase the performance of your image in that case. So to give you uh, the context, this is a radar panel. And in each, uh, I mean, in the two rows, you have 32 uh, modules. So in the previous uh, version, you had 16, and now you have to double the number of modules within the same uh, allowed area. And this is typically what we call miniaturization. And this is the two different modules uh, of the two different satellites. On the left, you have what we call micro-D connectors, which is a regular uh, miniaturized uh, rectangular connector. And on the right, you have a smaller connector, which is nano-D connector, which help reducing the overall size of the of the connector, of course, and the PCB and uh, module. So brief explanation about what is microD and nanoD. When we talk about rectangular connector, uh, the most common connector used is D-sub. It's quite old. It's already proven and it's used even today in many satellites. But we had a need quickly for miniaturized version. And we came with a microD uh, connector, which is a standard. It's used a lot for military uh, an aeronautic aerospace market. And more recently, we have reduced again the dimension of the contact connector to, to make what we call nano-D uh, contacts. And you can see on this picture the difference in terms of size for the contact, but not only the size, also the design. For this sub connector, it's really simple pin, uh, regular, regular pin. For microD and nanoD, it's slightly more complicated, and we use what we call pre-spin contact. It has a bump in the middle, and it will create some spring effect once mated to the to the mating socket contact. And this will give better performance in terms of uh, electrical continuity for vibration uh, mainly. So this is a nanoD connector which was which were used for this uh, particular project, and this is a complete harness. Uh, before integration. So here you can see uh, almost 600 points uh, in only 1.2 meter uh, uh, system. The next point is a bit different, is the flexibility mainly uh, related to routing of the cable. So as you know, the more system you have, the more interconnection you need between the different systems. And routing would be a, would be a concern. So the more cable you have, the bigger would be the bundle, and the flexibility will be reduced. So in this case, we will uh, consider the space wire. Space wire basically is a network assembly. Uh, it's a net. It's a standard cable standard used for the network of the satellite. It's more or less similar to an Ethernet cable, but adapted to the to the space satellite. 
This is an example in 2008 for satellites. Uh, we had eight of these space wires to be routed in the system. And you can already tell that it's quite stiff and difficult to do the, the bending and the cabling. In solar orbiter, uh, more recently, it was not eight, but 28 space wire, which had to be uh, integrated in the same uh, in the in the same satellite. So we had to use thinner and more flexible cable in order to achieve the integration. And as often for space projects, uh, the customer did not want to make any concession on the performance as well. So briefly to explain you the space wire, it's a standard, ESCC standard from the European Space Agency. Uh, it's fully defined, uh, the dimensions, the weight, everything is defined in the specification. So we had to adjust this design and make a new, uh, new version, which will meet the, the requirement. And to do so, we had different solutions, different options. So, First one, when you want to make a uh, cable more flexible, the first thing you can do is reducing the, the diameter uh, using a smaller wire. But if you do so, you will increase the loss. Uh, you will damage the uh, impact, the electrical performance. So what you can do is instead of using seven strands of your conductor, you can use 19. You increase the number of strands. You have the same section, but you have more flexibility because the strands will be smaller. The second option was to uh, change the material uh, slightly. The primary wires, uh, we usually use ex extruded, or expand, expanded uh, PTFE, sorry. Uh, here we have used alveolar PTFE. It's the same base material. The difference is that we inject air during the extrusion process. And since air, and in this case, vacuum in space, uh, has a very good dielectric property, it will help reducing the overall diameter of the cable with the same performance. And same for the outer jacket. Instead of extruded PTFE, we have used a uh, PFA, for, sorry, we have used a captain tape, which is smaller and uh, lighter as well. And as a last uh, way to optimize the flexibility, we have changed the construction of the cable. We have basically removed the jacket of each. Uh, individual twisted shifted pair. So this will change the electrical scheme. Uh, each uh, shield will be in contact, so you have only one potential. You have to consider uh, if this is acceptable uh, during your design, and for the customer it was. And this is another way to, to optimize. So at the end, we came up with a new uh, space wire. We could reduce the diameter by 8%. But most importantly, the bending radius, so directly linked to the flexibility by 45%. And in addition to that, uh, by using aluminum instead of copper for the shield, uh, we could save also 50% of, uh, of the mass. So it's a double win in this case for, for this design. This, what we call low mass space wire now, is fully homologated and qualified by ESA and already used in different, uh, different satellites. Now talking about the temperature, uh, extremely low temperature, what we call cryogenic application. Uh, in a satellite, uh, whenever you want to observe in the infrared range uh, to make some mapping of the space, for example, in the case of Planck satellite telescope, uh, you want to use extremely cold uh, equipment because the temperature will directly affect your, your result. It will create a lot of noise and you want to use a cryogenic application for, for this kind of system. For, for a satellite uh, called Gaia uh, telescope, we had an uh, interconnection uh, request for what, what the customer called M2 mechanism. They wanted to connect this mechanism to some PCB uh, electronics for, for the control. The problem that the customer had is this M2 mechanism was at minus 150 degrees. Uh, it was uh, the requirement they had the uh, heating uh, regulation. The electronics were kept at 20 degrees to keep the normal uh, operating temperatures. 
And consequently, you have a temperature gradient be between both uh, equipment of 170 degrees, which is extremely high. So we came with two different challenges. The first one is you need a, co a connector or material which will withstand the temperature minus 150 degrees. But also you want to avoid to have a thermal conduction between these two equipment because your harness, once connected, will create a thermal bridge between both. The first point uh, was relatively easy. Uh, we use connectors which are meant to be used for harsh environments. So most of the components were uh, compatible with this uh, low temperature application. However, some material, epoxy, uh, some insulation, uh, and the, the glue for the label uh, were slightly, uh, slightly uh, a bit weak in some, some points. So we had to adjust uh, the design and use different materials to, to make it compliant, to avoid cracks, to avoid the label to fly over in the, after some time and so on. And now regarding the thermal transmission, uh, the copper, as we said, is very good for electrical conductivity, but also for thermal conductivity. And in our case, we want to avoid this. So we have to find an alternate material. So there were different, uh, different candidates, brass, stainless steel, copper beryllium. And we had another requirement uh, asked for by our customer is uh, ESD, electric, electrostatic discharge. So we will come to this later. But basically, the traditional way to protect it is to add a metallic tape uh, to protect your cable from uh, electrostatic uh, accumulation. So if you do this, you add metallic material and you increase the size of the thermal bridge. So the best solution we, we came out was using stainless steel. It was the best compromise between the weight and the, the thermal conductivity. And also, we have replaced the shielding with uh, electrostatic discharge compatible material. So you will have more details in a uh, few slides. And as a result, uh, this was successfully used in different uh, satellites for similar applications. Uh, now we'll talk about the radiation resistance, radiation, radiation doses. So basically, uh, the sun will emit different types of uh, radiations. Uh, fortunately for us, we have uh, a magnetic field which will protect our equipment and ourselves in, uh, on Earth. But on space, uh, you will have no or less protection depending on your missions. And your spacecraft, your equipment will be more exposed to this. You have different types of radiation. Some will be easy to, to block with a simple, simple shield, for example. But mainly the gamma rays will be the one which will go through most of the materials. And this is uh, the most problematic uh, aspect of radiation resistance. So just for the vocabulary, when we talk about radiation dose, we talk about uh, rad or mega rad. And it's basically the amount of radiation that the material will be able to absorb by keeping the same uh, electrical properties or mechanical properties. The radiation will affect your material in many different ways. Uh, it will affect at the very atomic level, and it will, as a consequence, it will change the mechanical property, electrical properties. It will change the color if it's matter if it matters in some applications. So here again, fortunately, the space agencies had made a lot of research to help us for, for our design. And the NASA and ESA had made a big database of different materials and the acceptable radiation dose for each, uh, each of them. So some are very good, mainly the captain and peak. And some are not uh, very recommended, especially the PTFE and FEP, which are unfortunately very useful for, for harnessing, for cabling, uh, cable making. So we have to find some uh, 
some alternate or some way to, to use it. In our case for Meteosats, uh, we had a requirement for 170 megahertz, which start to be in the higher side of the exposition. exposition. Some part of the cable were kept outside of the satellite, which means it will be directly exposed to the radiation. And we had to use a PTFE uh, wire in our coaxial cable, which is required for the electrical performance. But unfortunately, the performance, as we have seen just before, is quite uh, weak. So the question now is, will this cable withstand or not the environment from, uh, from the customer. So we had to make a uh, simulation. So we have modeled the cable. Here we had four coaxial cables with one overall sheet for the protection. Basically, we have made a simulation. Uh, the radiation resistance, the, the radiation will go through each material as we have seen, and it will be absorbed few by few by the different layers. So we have analyzed the, the cable construction from the outer diameter, the outer shield, sorry, from the left, the gray, the gray bar, which will reduce the radiation dose by 10. And after you can see that the different insulation layer made of FEP and captain layers uh, will be directly exposed to the, to the resulting uh, radiations. And so on, you have individual shield, uh, dielectric, and so on. And once we have done this simulation, we have to analyze the results and to see if the different radiation, uh, radiation dose for each material is acceptable or not. Here we have FEP and PTFE, which has, we have seen is not recommended for space, for radiation resistance, sorry. Uh, the PTFE is even weaker than the FEP, but the resulting dose of radiation in the cable is less because of the different protection it has than the FEP, which is in the outer layer. So here, we just came to the conclusion and we had to change either the material used for the FEP by using PFA, for example, which is more resistant, or increase the, the shielding uh, effectiveness of the diameter additional shield or, or aluminum tape, for example. Uh, next point is the uh, atox is slightly uh, related to or similar to the radiation resistance. Basically, the again because of radiation resist because of the radiation emitted by the sun, uh, the di dioxygen which is in the higher uh, layer of the atmosphere will be broken. Basically, uh, it will break the, the link between the two oxygen and it will create uh, highly energetic uh, oxygen uh, atoms, which we call atomic oxygen or ATOX. This phenomenon will happen usually between 150 and 800 kilometers. So whenever you have a mission which is in low, low orbit or highly elliptical orbits, whenever you cross this area, you have to consider the ATOX as a potential uh, troublemaker. The traditional production we have here is as often we can just add a metallic tape, aluminum tape, for example, uh, and it will just physically block the atox, atomic oxygen, to impact the insulation of your cable. Or you can reconsider the routing by avoiding the cable to be directly outside of your, of your, of your satellite. But this may either increase the mass or make your harnessing your, your routing more complex. So we came out with a new material. Uh, we have developed uh, what we call Radatox, is the trade name of the, of the material. It has a very good resistance against Atox, so 10 times better than FEP and 100 times better than polyamide. And it also had a good radiation resistance up to 200 megawatts. So this is mainly used, the radatox is mainly used for the insulation of wires, or also for uh, PTF, uh, for tapes, protective tapes. And it's used for different projects. And for, for, as an example, we use it for cabling for 
solar panel in CubeSat. The ESD protection, uh, electrostatic discharge protection, so we will go more in detail here. Uh, basically, once again, because of sun radiation, uh, what happened is on the insulation of your cable of your, or your wire, you will have an accumulation of charges uh, due to different phenomena uh, resulting from the sun radiation. Because of the very good uh, insulation property of your insulation, which is why we use it as an insulator, uh, this charge will be accumulated and trapped on the surface and the potential, local potential at the surface will increase progressively. And at some point, it may create what we call ESD events. Uh, it's just an electric arc, which will release all the potential, all the charges trapped on the, on the wire on any nearby equipment. And this happened in 2003, where one satellite was completely lost within five or 10 minutes because of this, uh, this phenomenon. As it depends on the, it is a result of the sun radiation, it will depend on the altitude and also the inclination of your orbit. And here again, we have different ways to, to protect it. We can use a tape or we can consider a new routing to protect your cable inside the body of your satellite instead of outside. But we have the same issue, increase of the mass or more complex design of integration. So here there was a need for a new, uh, new material, uh, which is based on ETFE, uh, and it's called, it's anti in the anti-static field. Basically, when you see, uh, you look at the resistivity, uh, resistivity of material, you have two fields. One is insulative, and this is what we use for insulator, for connectors, for cables, for example. And the conductive part would be conductor like metallic, uh, copper, aluminum, iron, and semiconductive uh, components, for example. And in between, you have what we call anti-static, which is little bit conductor, little bit insulation. And we have found uh, a material in the, we, we have found the sweet spot between insulative and anti-static uh, fields. And the idea is if you have uh, conductivity, uh, resistivity relatively low, it will allow the charge to, which accumulate on the surface to few by few migrate inside your cable and be eliminated with, uh, with a conductor without affecting your, your equipment because it's only uh, charge by charge. It's very neglectable compared to your regular signal. And this will allow to, to free, the, to, to avoid the accumulation an increase of, uh, of the static charge locally. And one more phenomenon that we found with this particular material, this uh, anti-static ETFE, is that we have what we call smart anti-static behavior. And basically, at low voltage, it has a good resistivity. So it will work on normal operating, uh, operating mode. It will work as a normal insulation, which is what you want. And at high voltage, it will progressively reduce the resistivity. So if you have an anomaly, and in this case, the accumulation of uh, charges locally on the surface of the cable, the potential between the conductor and this area will increase. The resistivity will decrease slightly. It will allow the charges to pass through, and it will solve your issue. And this is the last point, and for once, it's not, uh, not a technical, technical point. It's about cost and cap production capacity. Uh, we have seen this last uh, 5, 10, 15 years, a new trend in space. Traditionally, when we were manufacturing satellites, we were making big satellites and extremely reliable. Because when you see uh, all the money and the resources that you invest in, in a telecom satellite, for example, you don't want it to fail after one or two years. So you want it to last as long as you can. Uh, this traditional space rely a lot on ESA and NASA specification and space agency specification because they want to have safety in their design. 
and they do require a lot of innovation, but mostly for better performances and mass saving. The new space is slightly different. We manufacture mostly small satellites, either microsat or nano, nanosat, tubesat, sorry. Uh, it is cheaper because the competition with the private market is uh, quite high. And not to say not reliable satellite, we would say disposable satellites. The idea is to manufacture, to send 10, 15, 100 satellites on, in orbit and estimate that X percent of the satellite will be enough to operate the complete network. Uh, we don't rely much more on space agency requirement. We are open spec, what we call open spec is basically it will allow more innovation uh, or original solution to solve a problem quickly because of against the competition. There is some innovation, but mostly to reduce the cost at the end, it can be technical solution which will help to reduce the cost and we'll see some example. The fast integration is a new requirement also. When you have a harness, uh, you want to integrate your harness quickly. Uh, in traditional space, you can have the several days or weeks of work just for integration of, uh, of the harness. In new space, we had a customer who asked for maybe five or 10 minutes max to integrate your harness. So we had to come with different uh, alternatives. And we also have to increase the production capacity for the satellite, because some satellite maker will make several thousand satellites for one constellation and for our side also to be able to provide the component requirement for, for these customers. So how to reduce the, the cost? Uh, first idea is we can use different components. We don't have to use necessarily space rate components, which will have uh, specific material like gut plating, uh, different uh, qualifications, which will help to make this connector more reliable. We can use mill grade connectors, which are uh, mechanically, electrically compatible also with the space requirements. Uh, but you have to be very careful when you select this kind of components. Uh, you have to consider the outgassing. Outgassing basically is the fact that some plastic material will uh, degas uh, in under vacuum, and this may affect your nearby equipment, especially if you have optics. Uh, it may uh, change the opacity of the of the lens, for example. Another option is to make the cabling outside a clean room to reduce the cost and accelerate a bit the, the process. And customers tend to request less and less documentation uh, or qualification to reduce the side cost of the, of the project. And another way to reduce the cost, not from our side, but for the customer side, is to increase the integration, the manufacturing capabilities capacities for the customer side. And to do this, we have developed a new range of connector, micro D connector, with quick mating, demating uh, hardware. Uh, the regular hardware, uh, regular micro D with a screw uh, require 15 to 20 seconds to mate and demate. Uh, you have to use a torque uh, and to make quarter turn for each side It's quite it's a process, it takes time, it's re reliable, but it takes time. Uh, we have made this, what we call D-click connectors, it's the trade name of the, of the range, and you can mate and demate in only two seconds. So it's, it has the same performance, and in addition to that, the click, which is made when once you made the connector, will help uh, reducing the quality and inspection cost, uh, because you know directly that the connector is properly mated. So this kind of uh, D-click connector help us to provide the complete harnessing solution. So signal power for one mega constellation, which has been launched in, uh, I mean, starting in 2020. And it is, it is used now in many uh, different programs. And it's also qualified by the European Space Agency. So as a conclusion, 
uh, space definitely is very challenging uh, in terms of technicity uh, and uh, we have seen also budget now. Uh, it, it will push the innovation for, of course, cable connector harnessing in our case, but in every field, and you are certainly uh, concerned as well. We didn't have today uh, the time to, to cover all the points, but you have different uh, other things to consider when you do a space, space project. Degassing, whiskers, it's related to the soldering. Uh, high temperature, we have seen low, but high is also an issue. Uh, what we call double insulation rules uh, and magnetic signature, which can be an issue in some uh, scientific, scientific uh, equipment. The new space will open doors to different uh, new challenges. Uh, miniaturization, and in this case, extreme miniaturization with CubeSats, uh, where you need nano deconnector, for example, or even smaller. Uh, the cost, which is a new concern uh, against reliability, and quick integration, uh, quick manufacturing. Thank you for your kind attention. And now we have some time for questions. Alexandre, muchísimas gracias por, por compartirnos esta presentación. Creo que estuvimos, tuvimos la posibilidad de, de conocer varias de las aplicaciones que muchas veces no llegamos a comprender dentro del sector espacial. Eh, a lo mejor una pregunta que yo tendría de, de, de manera personal sería, eh, en la parte de, de reducción de costos y la proyección como de, de impacto, de análisis de riesgo, ¿Cómo se visualiza eh, el análisis de a lo mejor que tu producto en el espacio tenga la posibilidad o eh, cómo se define la posibilidad de que este producto llegue a impactar con algún otro objeto fuera del espacio? ¿Hay alguna manera en que se define esa parte? Sorry, I'm not sure to have uh, uh, the question. Ah, okay, I'll change to English. So in this, in this case, for example, when there is a risk analysis for the kind of products that you are launching to space, okay. uh, is there a, uh, how do you incorporate in this risk analysis the, uh, the risk of being impacted by, a, by another object in space? Is there, is there like a table, like a chart, like a, and a specific number that you need to take care of it? Or how is the, it's planned? to avoid any kind of impact once you are in space. Do you mean the physical impact between two satellites as debris? Okay. Or maybe not other satellites, but other, I mean, rocks, stones, yeah, yeah. or some, something out there. How do you define this kind of impact and risk when you are planning to launch, to launch something to space? Okay. So this is a very huge, uh, subject in space and more and more. And luckily, uh, every most of the country now start to raise uh, the concern about it. Uh, we have, uh, especially with, uh, with the apparition of mega constellation, you have more and more object in space. Uh, we reduce, we try to reduce the number of space debris in, uh, in orbit when we launch the, the satellite, we try to recover as much as we can uh, the body of the launcher and so on. Uh, and now we, have, we are considering uh, different missions in different countries uh, for space debris management. Uh, it can be how to deorbit uh, Geosat uh, satellite, for example, uh, how to, or how to adjust your to send back to to us and destroy it. Uh, this is a big concern. At our level, when we talk about the design of a satellite, so for the sat for the harness making, and I believe even for the uh, satellite maker, it's very difficult to project uh, what would be the risk of, of collision of impact in, uh, in space. I would say this is more a concern of the mission planner or the launcher. Uh, how to coordinate with the different uh, constellations, different satellites, uh, or uh, debris which 
debris which are already uh, known and followed by, by some uh, teams, scientists team to, to evaluate the, the risk. Uh, but this is, when you make the satellite, uh, you don't have a plan. I mean, the, when you make a harness, if it collides with a, with a rock, the mission is, is done. You, you have to make, uh, for example, for the space, uh, space station, you have to consider some shielding to protect your equipment, your, your, uh, your, the crew of the, uh, of the ISS station, for example, or the Chinese one, or, because obviously you don't want to lose any, any human, uh, human life. Uh, this, is, this is more mechanical parts, uh, like additional shielding. It can be uh, different layers of uh, very thin protections. Uh, but when you make a satellite, I, I've never had any experience of mechanical protection against impact. It's more uh, how to plan your launch and how to choose your orbit to, to make it safe, basically. Okay, understood. Thank you, Alexander. We have a couple of questions. In this case, is Raul Ugalde from Consensol in Querétaro, where okay. Axel is located. Uh, he, uh, he's asking if there is like a availability for having a optical fever applications in this kind of harnesses when you are using these uh, harnesses in the space. Yeah, we have some yeah completely. Uh, we, we manufacture some optic fiber. Uh, it, it was mainly for military application. And we have made a space grade uh, version, uh, which has, uh, I'm not sure about the material, I would say either PFA or Radato uh, uh, Radatox, uh, the one we discussed for, for the Radatox resistance. And radiation was uh, This is basically uh, you have, for example, Kevlar protection or fiber, glass fiber protection, and you have an overall uh, insulation. This is like a wire, basically. So for this, the space grade optic fiber already exists, and there have been some uh, studies which were made to evaluate the impact of radiation of the fiber on the fiber, especially on the performance, because uh, uh, the clarity of the material of the fiber will be impacted by, resist uh, by radiation. So we have made this kind of campaign and yeah, it's available. And after you will have the same uh, questions. Do you want to add an overall shield to protect? Do you want flexibility? Do you want... Uh, th this is the same. Uh, I will many, many that many points. in terms of the application of, or where this harness is going to be located. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Alexander. There is another question. It's related to the kind of material, the and and the the that performance, the performance of these materials. Is there a specific uh, test that you do once you have these harnesses made, uh, like in laboratories, and if there is some labs in Mexico or something like that? Do you have some comments about it, Alexander? Yeah, so we could make a complete presentation about testing, especially for space. Uh, in in space, you have what you call what we call LAT, uh, lot acceptance, lot acceptance test. Uh, basically, it's a battery of tests. Uh, you have three different levels. The number three is a basic. It would be electrical uh, control, dimension, visual, like the regular uh, control. And LAT2 LAT uh, LAT and LAT1 would be some additional testing. It can be uh, thermal shock, vibration test, uh, micro section, where you cut your connector and you have some microscopic uh, analysis of the plate of the surface treatment thickness and everything. Uh, and for this, we will manufacture more connectors or assembly, depending on the, the level. And we will make some samples. We will take random samples from the final batch and make some destructive tests for this. This is uh, basically what we do for, for space. We have also qualifications and requalification tests. So every two years, when we make a new, a new product, you will qualify. Again, you will have 
similar to a LAT, but with some additional uh, testing. It will be radiation resistance, for example, where you will send the sample to a laboratory which have uh, a radioactive uh, material to do some tests uh, and diff different tests. And every two years, normally for ESA, at least, I'm not sure for NASA, uh, you have renewal test, which is light version of, uh, of this qualification test. It can be just a lat one, for example. And this will help you. It will give the opportunity for the customer to rely on us, uh, considering that we have tested this technology with so-and-so uh, test reports uh, or testing. And if you try, and every two years, we are renewed to make sure we don't have any long-term deviation in the process or quality. And if you want, we can make a special lab for this particular batch. This is what we have done a lot for, for example, European and Japanese in my case. Uh, they want to be 100% sure, so they want to qualify each batch. So this is the kind of option we can, uh, we can make. And we, this kind of test can be done partially in-house. We have a lot of mechanical stress machine, uh, thermal, uh, for thermal cycling, vacuum, and so, and some like radiation resistance, aging, and so, would be uh, self-contracted. Okay, thank you, Alexander. There is another additional question from, uh, well, in this case, it's Anaya. Um, they are asking if there is any specific function of the harnesses that are installed outside of the of the satellite versus the ones that are inside the satellites. Is there some like a general function of this kind of cables and harnesses? No, there's no general rules. It's really what the customer needs. Mm -hmm. So I would say the easy uh, example would be when you have a, an antenna outside of your, of your satellite and you have the control unit in the body. The connector, you, you would use, for example, uh, RF assembly, uh, radio frequency uh, coaxial cables. It will be connected inside the box, going through a panel uh, feed through, and it can go outside. And here you will have just a partial exposure of your assembly, and the rest will be protected inside. Some customers want to avoid it, and they will have uh, the cable routed in the in a tube, for example, or some have no choice. If you have a probe which is far from the satellite, like two meters away, you may want to, you, you may have no choice and you, you have to find a, a way. So you can add the shield, or as we have seen, we can select it. We can select appropriate materials. Okay, understood, Alexander. Well, thank you a lot for this question. We have additional questions in the chat, but the, unfortunately, we are we're about to, to close the webinar. So just to remind you that the, uh, infor, uh, the, the, the contact information from Alexander, it's, it's already shown. If you have some additional information about Axon or about this presentation, please uh, be in contact with Alexander. Um, Alexander, we want to thank you your time the information that you share with the team and with all the audience uh, regarding this uh, specific topic. Thank you so much for, for this presentation, for being part of, the, for being part of this webinar. Uh, we, will, we will be more than glad to having you again in, uh, in another edition. Thank you so much, Alexander. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much to all of you. Y recordarles a toda la audiencia que la próxima semana, en punto de las 11 del día, tendremos eh, un webinar más referente a los fenómenos, fenómenos electromagnéticos eh, en la industria aeronáutica eh, enfocados en la física por medio de gemelos digitales. Eh, los invitamos a registrarse, a seguirnos en redes sociales, ahí van a encontrar este webinar y otros más que hemos realizado y pues nuevamente agradecerles su tiempo. Alexandre, muchas gracias y muchas gracias a todos. Sí, muchas gracias. Hasta luego.